Um, we say it right before the prayer. Yeah, near to the heart of God. Near to the heart of God. That's one of my favorites. It's the top, my type of song that I would use with the lesson. Exactly the same exact idea. And so we have this song, He's My Lord. We'll be learning that in just a little bit. As we are going to be talking this evening into how to live a life that pleases God. I think that's what all of us want to do. I think anybody who believes that there is a God wants to live a life that pleases God. I have met people who think that it's beyond them, that uh, they have messed up so much that it's impossible, and they feel that pressure, they feel that pain because they don't think that God wants anything to do with them. I know when I was young and door knocking one time, I uh, met such a man. And he looked sad. And he, I thought what he said to us was very, very honest. I'm sorry, son, I don't think you can help me. I'm an atheist. He wanted to believe, but he couldn't believe in God. I have no idea how that feels. I have no idea how that feels, but that has to feel badly. I want to live a life that pleases God. And yet, many times, very often, every day, I recognize there are things that I fail at. And so I'm going, how can the world can I please God? Because I keep messing up, and what am I going to do about it? This evening, we're going to look at that and a few other things. But let's go ahead and look at this song. We'll sing it through a couple times here, as it's, as it's indicated here. This is not a fast song. It's a very beautiful song and a very meaningful song. Do me so me do please my Lord there is no means whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. 
whether it's convenient or not, I'm going to do it. Whether it's what I'd rather do or not, that's what I'm going to do. That, that, that term of Lord means you're in charge. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what you say. And one of the things that we also talked about during many of those lessons is that God has a plan for you. No matter what your background is, no matter where you started in life, God has a plan for you. If you came from a dysfunctional family, and there's lots of those nowadays, and a lot of us find out later now that we're grown up, you know what, we grew up in a dysfunctional family, we just didn't have a word for it when we were growing up. We thought it was normal. Well, guess what? Nowadays, that is normal. Dysfunctional is the norm. But even if you grow up in a dysfunctional family like Joseph in the Old Testament, God can use you if you treat him as Lord. We found out that maybe you're in an adopted family and you really don't have any place where you belong, kind of like Moses. But God can use you if you'll let him. Maybe you come from a blue-collar family like Peter, and, you know, some of your habits are kind of rough, and you're just, you know, you get out there, you've got scars on your body and on your hand, and you know how to get out there and work, and you live by, you know, whatever comes to a thought, you go and do it, and you're impulsive, and it gets you in trouble sometimes, but if your desire is to call Jesus Lord, then that's going to keep bringing you back, and you're going to go, okay, what do you want me to do? What are you going to want me to do? And you're going to end up doing something good for God's work. It might not be flashy. It might not be noticed by a lot of people. But it will be noticed by God. And we also talk about what I think is one of the most difficult. Is actually growing up in a religious family. Because like Paul, at some point you've got to come to where you're going to say, Okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to do what God wants me to do, or am I doing it because it's what my parents want me to do? And our parents might have really good intentions and have all the right words and things, but at some point it has to transfer over. I'm not doing it because of my parents. I'm doing it because of God. Because that's what our parents want us to do it for. It's not for them. It's for God. And then we can pass that along and pass that along. And so we can have a lot of different backgrounds, but we can all come to the same point where I'm going to do what I can do to serve God. And this weekend we're going to talk about keeping spiritual growth growing. In Jude, verses 21 and 22, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on some have compassion making a difference. Making a difference. You know we're supposed to make a difference? And sometimes we look at that, about this idea of making a difference, and we think, well, I've got to do something that everybody notices. Well, I think in life, the people who make a real difference aren't noticed. I really don't care about famous people like movie stars and sports stars and things like that. I don't think they're very important. Because if that person wasn't the touchdown leader, guess what? The next person in line would be, wouldn't they? Back at home this year, we have a really good football team. Last couple games, we've only had like a total of six first downs. Because after three plays, we have a touchdown. but flashy doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't matter. You know who matters? It's the nurse nobody notices at the hospital that's working with that patient that nobody else wants to be near because it's scary. And life has changed over the last couple, few weeks since we were here, hasn't it? Because in our nation, we are now afraid of something. We are afraid of something that is really scary. We've got this disease. Oh, it's always been around, but it was elsewhere. But now it's real. And we need to understand inside of the church there is sin that is real. It's been kind of hidden. But it's real. We have to be very careful. Just because they have a certain name on the door doesn't mean they're following God's word. And we want to be with people who are following God's word. We want to open it up and say, hey, if I'm doing something wrong, let's find it so we can fix it. 
If I'm forgetting to do something, let's find it in God's word so we can start doing what we're supposed to do. And until we wake up to that, we don't even know that we've got a disease that can ravage us. Making a difference. We can make a difference. Another uh, translation says making a distinction. Making a distinction. We have to be willing to make a distinction and say, you know what? This is right and this is wrong. This is where God stands and he's my Lord. That's where I'm going to stand. And other people might say, well, you know, you're not supposed to judge other people. I don't judge other people, but I can say, here's what God said. Here's what God said we should do. Here's what God said we should not do. It's where we can go. Making a distinction. In Colossians chapter 1, starting verse 9, we read this. For this reason also, or for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And we're not going to talk about all that tonight because there's a month's worth right there. But notice where it hinges. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's how he delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us or conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of Love. If you haven't done what God said, if you haven't been redeemed through his blood, if you don't have that forgiveness of sins, then the stuff we're going to talk about really doesn't apply. I think most everybody here this evening has been there and has done that. But I want us to back up a little bit and look at this little part. Because sometimes we read through things and we can pass over something that ought to just kind of stand out, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. I think that's a tall order, and I'm not very good at things that are tall. That's a tall order. And God never asks us to do something that we can't do. Anything we can't do, God will take care of. If he asks us to do something, if he says we should be doing something, we can do it, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. And what in the world does it mean to live a life that fully pleases him? Because I mess up every day. Sometimes I mess up real big. Sometimes I mess up in ways I think I'm the only one who notices. Probably not, but I think I'm the only one who notices. And if we were pressed for the answer, if someone said, okay, right now, what do you think it means to be, live a life that pleases God? Most of us would start writing off a list of external behaviors that we could do and we could see in somebody and say that's what you have to do to live a life that pleases God. Okay, we might talk about certain experiences such as how were you converted to become a Christian? What was your method of baptism? Any secondary experiences that you might have had, what did you do? We might talk about the absence of certain vices. Well, you know, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't cuss. I don't watch bad movies. Did you know it wasn't all that long ago that people would include in that list? I don't play cards. I don't watch TV. I don't listen to the radio. And you know why people refused those things at first? Because they understood everything can be used for bad or good, and they saw the potential for the bad. But they're all just options. They're all things that can be used for good. They're all things that can be used for bad. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on the radio that's, well, there's some stuff on the radio that's good, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's bad. There's some stuff on TV. There's a little bit of stuff on TV that's good. There's a whole bunch. doesn't matter one way or the other. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's bad. 
On the internet, there are some things that are good, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's bad. In books, you remember what the first printing press was used for? Print the Bible. But how many things have been printed that are not any good? So are books good or bad? Neither. Good or bad is for people. It's how they're used and what we use them for. Those are absence of certain vices right there. And it might be religious issues, your view on abortion, the view of the end times, uh, your stance on spiritual gifts. By the way, all that thing about end times, you watch, I think it's already happening. Oh, this is a sign of the end times. We've been in the last days for almost 2,000 years. Okay? There's, oh, this disease is a sign of the end of the times. We've been in the sign of the end times for 2,000 years. We're in the last ages. Your stance on spiritual gifts. Someone might talk uh, about which particular translation of the Bible that you use. That used to be big several years ago, still important to some people. I won't argue about it. I won't argue about it. I think there's more important things to worry about. The problem with these things is they're all externals. What was that song? Near to the heart of God. You can't see that. You can't see on externals if somebody is near to the heart of God. You can't see on externals if they really believe that he's my Lord. In fact, if we listen closely to that list of those external things, we end up really saying the one that pleases God is the one who is most like me. Because that's what we do. We say, well, I think I've got it all figured out, so do you agree with me? You must be good. You don't agree with me. You must be bad. We become the standard. Wait a minute. Who's supposed to be the standard? The Lord. The Lord. And I can always find somebody who does things worse than me. I can always find somebody who does things better than I do. But we like to, well, you know, I'm better than that person. I must be okay. That other person's not the standard. Jesus is the standard. We want to live lives that please God. And we seek to define that by our experiences and our beliefs and what we've been through. And that's what Saul did. And he would have never become Paul if he stayed there. We get it backwards. Instead of us changing and become what God wants to be, we end up trying to change God into what we want him to be. Let's see what the Apostle Paul had to say about what pleasing God looks like in verses 10 through 12. We see four characteristics of life that is pleasing to the Lord. In verse 10 it says, being fruitful in every good work. So we have to bear fruit. It also says they're increasing in the knowledge of God. So we have to be growing in knowledge. It talks about being strengthened with all might. And in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. Now is that the only thing he talks about in these verses? No, but that's directly involved when he talks about living a life fully pleasing to him. That's direct. I don't have to guess that these things are involved in it. Bearing fruit, growing in knowledge, being strengthened, giving thanks. See, this is a much different approach than the external behaviors. The external behaviors, things other people can see, things that I can see, all of these, nobody else really knows. Nobody else really knows. Instead of comparing ourselves with others, we have to compare ourselves with God's design. Instead of spending our time focused primarily on our horizontal relationships with other people, there's me, there's others, and as long as I'm a little bit better than some of them, I must be okay. We're supposed to be worrying primarily about our vertical relationship with God. What does God want me to be, and where do I stand in relationship to that? Now, does that mean that other people don't matter? No. Because if my relationship with God is correct, that other part is going to come along with it. 
This idea of bearing fruit is not foreign to us. We know about fruit trees. In Colossians 1 verse 10 it says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God. We know about bearing fruit. We take the fruit tree down at the, the, uh, or the uh, place where they sell those things. We take it, we plant it, and we take care of it. We buy the stuff that you're supposed to go down, we cut the burlap, dig the hole, we fertilize, we pour all the stuff to help the roots grow, we water it, we put the stake in so when the wind blows it doesn't shake it all apart and break up the roots. We take care of that and we keep the animals away from it. We might put some chip and wire around it so the deer don't come along and peel off the bark. We do everything we can to make that tree grow. But you know what? If it's supposed to be an apple tree and it never gives us apples, we have a problem. Of course, down here probably peaches. We don't get peaches off that thing. And we've gone so many years we're going to be upset if we're supposed to get peaches off of it and all of a sudden we're getting some other type of fruit. We're not going to be pleased. If after many years it's not doing what it's supposed to do, hopefully we can find the receipt, but they count on me never being able to find it. And we're going to take the tree back and get our money back. But we're never going to get our money back for our time and our effort but we will be upset because the tree did not live up to its advertising. We understand about bearing fruit. And Jesus says that the same is true of people who profess faith. He says you will know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from, th from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. So we are supposed to be watching and being careful. Where's the source of what we're getting? And we know what to refuse and what to get. But Jesus talks about this. Notice he talks about false prophets. And this is Jesus talking. It happened before he came. It happened while he was here. It happened after he came. And there are still false prophets out there in the world. So how can we tell if someone is professing to be a believer, but isn't a believer? Well, we can tell by watching their lives. If there's not a change in their living, then we conclude, conclude that there's not a change in their soul where it matters. But you know what? That's backwards. That's back to the external. We're watching them and whether or not they are bearing fruit, and that's not our job. That's God's job. It's how can I tell if I'm a believer? I can tell by watching my life. I can compare my life today to what it was a year ago. Or five years ago. Or whatever moment it was, I realized, you know what, there's something I need to work on. And so I can look back periodically and say, am I working on it? Did I acknowledge it and didn't do anything about it? Well, that makes me a hypocrite. Am I doing something to change or am I just doing the same old thing? Are you changing your living to becoming what God has taught you? And if there's not a change to God's way of living, then there's something wrong. Now we understand from this takes time. And part of our impatience with ourselves is, okay, I know I've got this problem. I want to be perfect at it tomorrow. And that doesn't happen. And we get discouraged and we get disappointed. You know, you usually don't get good fruit the first year that you plant a tree. There's some trees that it takes several years. And there are some skills, there are some things that God wants us to work on that take a lot of time. There's other things that we can say, you know what? I need to quit doing that. I need to start doing this over here. And that's one of the reasons why we're supposed to go to our brother or our sister in Christ and say, hey, I need help with this. This is what I'm working on. This is something, you know, that lesson a couple weeks ago? Well, I was thinking about that, and I decided I need to work on this. Will you help me? Will you help me? Will you help me get these weeds out of my life? Will you help me to put in the things I need to put in? 
And that idea is throughout the New Testament and the teachings to the churches that we're supposed to acknowledge each other, we're supposed to pray for each other, we're supposed to help those who are stronger, we're supposed to help those who are weaker. Because it takes time for that tree to mature, but that tree needs a stake. It needs some fertilizer, it needs some watering, it needs some help to get along the way. And so that same idea is true for followers of Christ. That change may not be immediately discernible, but over time you should be seeing a difference in your life. And you pick any event. It could be every New Year, it could be your birthday, it could be an anniversary, start of school, certain thing that happens every year, and you check, how am I different this year than I was a year ago? Am I the same? Well, then there's a problem. It should be changing, it should be growing, it should be better at something. See, false prophets tell you something that you want to hear instead of telling you what you need to hear. False prophets might tell you it doesn't matter how you live. There's a lot of that nowadays in the name of Christianity. They might tell you that it's okay to do something that Scripture says is wrong because they'll say, well, God's grace will cover it. Uh, God doesn't give grace on willfully not doing his will. There's a problem there. They'd be wrong when they profess that teaching. They might tell you that, you know, you can just say a prayer and become a child of God. And again, they would be wrong because the Bible never says that. Listen to these words in, that we'll read here in just a little bit that Paul writes to the Galatians. And in this passage... Paul is going to contrast the life of the sinful nature, the life that doesn't please God, and the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So if we didn't cover it, he covered it. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, this passage is an important passage. It's a good one to read every day for a while to see what he's talking about. He continues, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And of those things, he says, against such, there is no law. You can do those despite wherever you live. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. See, the person who is pleasing to God will see a change in their values. And there will be a change in their behavior. You know, those who are living together outside of the confines of marriage, which means they're committing adultery, fornication, and lewdness, they'll get married. Because they'll say, I need to change. That was wrong. What do we need to do? You need to correct it. Those who've been using others, instead will begin serving others. Those who relish tearing others down by whispering will now seek ways to build them up because they're going to change their behavior. The party animal will learn to live in moderation. And this is a message that we need to keep repeating to each other. You know that old adage, practice, practice, practice? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know we all mess up, we trip up, we do things. But there's a difference in practicing it. Purposely going out and doing something and saying, well, you know, later on I'll do something about it. That means you already know you need to do something about it. The life that pleases God is the one that glorifies God in our daily life. In how we do our job at work or if we're the student at school. The way we handle our mistakes, the way we treat our families. The life that pleases God is the one that keeps on growing in knowledge. Continually try to seek to know God better. But as I try to understand the force of what's being said here, I'm going to have to do two negatives. And I really don't like doing negatives. I like to just do the positive side of the scripture. But 
We talk about this increasing in the knowledge of God. We have to be very careful. First of all, the first negative is that growing in the knowledge of God is not the same as seeking to learn how to get more from God. There's a lot of people who name Christianity that just treat, teach people, well, you do this and this and this, and you get all this stuff from God. You give so much of this, your seed money, and he'll bless you with this. So send me your seed money, and you'll get so many blessings. See, a lot of times people are concerned with how they can tap into God's resources. We want to know how, well, how can we get God to answer our prayers? How can we get God to meet our needs? How can we get God to banish our problems? And that's all selfish. If your parents only came to you when they wanted something from you, would you go if they loved you? They wouldn't have anything to do with you except for when they wanted something from you. Would you feel that they loved you? If your parents spent their whole life studying how they could get you to give them what they wanted, would you feel like they loved you? Or would you feel used? <clears throat> now reverse it back the way everybody else in the world would say it. If your kids only came to you when they wanted something, would you feel like they really loved you? If your kids spent all the time studying what buttons can I push so they can do this and this and this for them, would you really feel like they loved you? Or would you feel used? And yet that's what a lot of people do in their relationship with God. What can I do to get God to do what I want him to do? That's not love. That's using God. Second negative. Growing in the knowledge of God is not the same as growing in knowledge about God. A lot of people are good at that. Boy, they know lots of stuff. And Jesus had a lot of problems with people like that who knew their scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, forwards and backwards. They could quote scriptures on and on and on. And they spent all this time learning about God, but they didn't have an actual proper relationship with God. He was something that they used. Some people become so smart in their knowledge, they become dumb. They become so learned, such deep knowledge thinkers about God, that they're able to say, well, yeah, I know the scripture says that, but we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, where does God say that that's correct? And it ends up being, with great knowledge, they're going away from God instead towards Him. You know, there's always the difficulty of sub substituting facts for a relationship. Have you ever had a craving? Now up in Oregon where we go up in the summers and where we're from, there's a company called Dutch Bros. And uh, it's, it's kind of like Starbucks, only a uh, lot. They got all types of fancy stuff that Starbucks is trying to do now. And they actually took on Starbucks in their own backyard. And the people up there, oh, that's all they talk about is Dutch Bros, Dutch Bros, Dutch Bros. You know what? It's okay. But I can live without it. But they all think it's important. So once this person thinks it's important, the other person thinks it's important, the other person, and just goes and goes and goes and feeds on itself. You know, you have that craving. You've got to have this thing. So everybody thinks it's important. We need to crave to know God. We need to crave to know what he wants. We need to crave to understand what he wants us to do. Do you read the Bible for facts or to discern? That's why I love this song, The Heart of God. Why do you read the Bible? Are you want to know about God? He reveals himself in his word. Or do you just want to know facts? Are you looking for information or direction? There's a distinction. We're not merely looking for information. These people, if we want to live a life that pleases God, we need to read the Bible, we need to pray. You know, prayer is, for a lot of us, and I'm including myself in this, not uh, some of us, we just feel uncomfortable in it. We always feel like we didn't do a good job. 
Well, he's like, you know, I missed that part. I've already talked about how the Holy Spirit helps us in that. <coughs> we need to make sure that our prayer time is not just filled with requests. That we use our prayer time to work in our relationship with God. That we talk about learning from God. That we ask Him to help us as we read His Word. As we listen to a lesson. As we try to apply the things that we're learning. We're asking God to help us to do a better job of it. You know, if a boy and a girl are starting to become a boyfriend and girlfriend, the boy goes over to the house and they bring out the photo album and is interested in the family. Well, what's this one about? What were y'all doing in this picture? Well, that shows some interest, doesn't it? It shows some caring. It shows that the person wants to know about that person better. When we open up God's words, that's his photo album that talks about how he works with his people, the things that he's done, how he, when people trust him, here's what he does, and when they go against his will, here's what happens. And we have the Old Testament recorded for us to help us to understand this mindset of God and what God expects of his people. And we're doing that not because we expect a reward, but because we want to learn from God. We're eager, very eager to learn. Making sure that we are seeking the truth and not simply ammunition to defend the point we already have. That's back to those externals. See, I have to remind myself that I'm not to be reading the Bible just for sermon ideas. That's not what's supposed to be my primary purpose. I'm not supposed to be reading the Bible just to defend my convictions that I already have. I'm supposed to read the Bible because I want to know God better. I read the Bible to get to know God better. Back in verse 11 of Colossians 1, it says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. So we need to bear fruit, we need to grow in knowledge, and we are supposed to be strengthened in this life that fully pleases God. Paul tells the Colossians that a life that pleases God is one that is strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. But notice the purpose of this power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. This power is not to beat somebody else over the head with. It's not to show that we're better than somebody else. It's not to show how more religious we can be but it's to have long-suffering, to have great endurance, to have patience. The way we might say it nowadays, to hang in there. To hang in there. It is a strength that helps us to endure the troubled times of life. And this word patience deals with our ability to relate or deal with difficult people. All of us have to deal with difficult people from time to time. Sometimes we're that difficult person. And God gives us the patience to work with those people who annoy us. Those people who, di who disturb us. Those people who make us want to scream sometimes. And God gives us that ability because that's part of the working of the Holy Spirit that reminds us of the promises of God's Word. Tells us that God is in control when some circumstances and people cannot overthrow his plan. We, we talked about previously with Moses and Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought he had God's plan. Look, God won. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they want to do the right thing. So they did the, the, what they're supposed to do. And they weren't going to bow down to that image. They got caught for that. So they got thrown to the fiery furnace. Remember, they came out. The people who threw them in got harmed, but they came out. They didn't even smell like smoke. If you're anywhere near a fire, you're going to smell like smoke. They didn't even smell like smoke. Herod had his plan to kill the Christ child. God's plan is what happened, though. In the crucifixion of Jesus, you can just see Satan thinking, I, I won. And in his thinking he won, he lost. Because that was God's plan the whole time that Jesus Christ was going to raise from the dead. God is in control and God only does what is good. You know, I may not understand what's happening, but I know that God has a purpose. God never makes a mistake, but I do. God never makes a mistake, but parents do. 
God never makes a mistake. Children do. Teachers do. God, though, never makes a mistake. Never. When people try to say, well, yeah, God said that says that in the Bible, but, you know, we don't have to. Uh-uh. That doesn't work. This world is not our home. Just a passing through is how the song goes. We need to make sure we don't let the events of this world let us down. So in hard times, we don't complain. We trust. In hard times, we don't walk away. We listen. And we try to learn. What does God want me to do? In hard times, we don't despair. We hang on tighter, especially with those of like minds trying to serve God. But you know, being strong in difficult times or times of trouble is difficult. But it may not be as difficult as the concept as patience with difficult people. I am not the most patient person. In fact, there is nothing that tries my patience like an annoying person. And guess what you need the most patience? With an annoying person. But you have to understand, I teach junior high. Annoying people, I have a hard time having patience with them. I teach junior high. Sometimes I teach junior high pre-engineering. That's not bad. Those kids are pretty, some of the better kids. But annoying people try my patience. I teach the GT kids. That's usually pretty good, but there's one or two. They're in GT because they try your patience. I teach... 7th grade math. Annoying people try my patience. This year's much better than last year. There's nothing that tries my patience like an annoying person. I get tested every day of the week in their school. And when I come home, I have to look in the mirror and, oh, there's me. And I try my patience as much as anything because I'm an annoying person. I can't escape it. But see, that's the point. We're the annoying person to somebody else. We annoy somebody because they just can't stand the way we are. People naturally react to difficult people negatively. But we're in Christ. He gives us a different perspective. God teaches me patience with others by reminding me that I was and I often still am a difficult person. You know, sometimes people just need a bit of a doubt because everybody from time to time have a bad day. And some people, they have a bad life. Sometimes these kids come to school and they may get in trouble in every single class at school, but school's still the best part of their day. Can you imagine that? Going to a place, you get in trouble with every single teacher, and that's as good as your whole day gets. Because going home is worse. That's what some people live with. Sometimes people are just having a bad day and we need to give them that benefit of the doubt. You know, most difficult people are people who are hurting and they will lash out in ways that may not be related at all to what it is that they're lashing out to. They may not want to acknowledge their pain or even worse, they may not know how badly they're hurting. They just, it's what they do. That's how they cope. That's how they get by. They might not know any better. See, judging a person's heart and motives is something that's not my job. It's God's job. God can do it. I can't. See, God has this history of transforming people when I would have stopped trying. Let's try the song one more time. He's my Lord. There
he want? What does he want me to do? What does he want me to get rid of? What does he want me to add? What does he want me to change? As we're each trying to do that, our horizontal relationship will grow stronger and tighter because we'll be trying for the same thing. The life that pleases God is lived gratefully, giving thanks to the Father. You know, a lot of times we fail to do that. We complain about the weather when we should be grateful simply to be alive. We complain about our income, and especially about our taxes that take away our income, when we should be grateful that we have some sort of income. We complain about the government, although we should be grateful that we don't live in an anarchy. We complain about how our food was cooked or how long the wait for takes. Well, we should just be grateful that we have some food to eat. We complain about our clothes being out of style and we should be grateful for having anything to wear. We complain about other believers that aren't as spiritual as they should be. Well, we should be thankful to God that you know not all members do the same things. Some people are able to do one thing and others the other. And while we might have certain things we're all supposed to try to do, be thankful that there are people who can do it better than you can. That doesn't mean you should give up trying to be better. But be glad that more than one person can get up and speak. Be glad that more than one person can lead song. Be glad that, there, that there's more than one person who can go visit the hospitals. Because there's certain things that some of us, we're just no good at. So we're thankful somebody else can do it. We complain about the traffic. Well, we should be glad that we can travel with these. We went over 800 miles from yesterday at 6 o'clock in the afternoon to here. Unheard of 100 years ago. Isn't that a blessing? And we complain. We complain. We complain about the crowds of the store when we should be glad that we're able to go someplace and buy something instead of having to grow, raise our own animals and take off the wool and make our own clothes and make everything for ourselves, which wasn't all that long ago that most people had to do. By the way, if you don't like clouds, let me give you a hint. Don't go to Walmart on Saturdays. It's always busy. Uh, another hint, if you don't like crowds from Thanksgiving, to New Year's, don't go to the stores. Any store. It's going to be busy. And I love people who go the day after Thanksgiving. We used to do that all the time. They go shopping, and they complain about how long the lines are. Well, duh. What did you think was going to happen? But we put ourselves in situations like that, and then we complain about what we knew was going to happen. Get the idea? We thank God while complaining that he should have given us more. See, we seem to think that if God really loved us, we would have less problems, we'd have more money, we'd have more stuff, we'd have more influence, we'd have less illness, more good times, less difficult times, and God never promised any of that. In our prayers, we tell God all the time that we're grateful, but do we really act like it? When we're not praying, do we talk like it? Are we thankful that we're able to pull off to the side of the road and put some air in our tire even though it costs a dollar? And then find a place that I could pay 16 bucks to get the screw that was in my tire today repaired. Wasn't that nice? Just only 16 bucks. Instead of being on the side of the road for hours. We say in our prayers, Lord, we thank you. But by the rest of our day, do we really would we believe us? Gratitude begins when we realize that we do not deserve the inheritance that's been given us. We don't deserve the salvation that's been given us. We don't deserve being able to come here together and worship God. We don't deserve being able to be together and sing songs. We don't deserve getting to be together and pray. But we get to anyway. Isn't that great? We could spend every waking moment being grateful to God that His Son pulled us from the jaws of hell and that would not be enough time to say everything that we ought to be saying. 
Jesus has taken our dead in life and set us on a course for eternity, and we need to think of where we would be if he had not drawn us to him. However we got there, from different paths, from different ways. I know my path was different than most people, how I got to the church. Some people call this an attitude of gratitude. That's a good little phrase. I certainly, certainly did not originate it. But when was the last time that you thanked God for being able to take a breath? When did you last thank God that the sky was blue? That you got to hear a bird sing? When did you last thank Him that you get to live in this country with all its faults, but you get to live in this country that so many people are desperate to get to? That you get to live in your state? That you get to live in your town? That you get to live in your home? When's the last time that you thanked God for the Bible? For fellow believers, you may not see eye to eye, but you know that they love God and want to serve Him, and so do you. And you're glad you have somebody that you can visit with and talk about and sometimes argue with. When's the last time you thanked God for your warm home, for the conveniences of air conditioning, of having lights, things that we kind of consider rights because we sure get mad when they get removed from us? When did you last thank him for your family, even if it's one of those weird ones that has all types of trouble? When's the last time you thanked God for keeping us honest and accountable to him and each other? When was the last time you thanked him for the trials on your patience? The difficulties of life that keep things in perspective for us. See, inheritance is not deserved. It's a gift. And we have a gift from God. We need to learn to open our eyes to God's blessings. That's true with our horizontal relationships with each other and help each other do that. It's true of our vertical relationship with God. We only have a small idea of God's greatness. And I hope every day you learn something new about it. As we study his words, we study his actions in the Bible, as we become more attuned to his character, we will learn to grow in our gratitude, gratitude that we're united with Christ in baptism, gratitude that we can be called his children, gratitude for the abundance of blessings that come from that relationship. Look at the words of the song. He's my Lord. There is no other one who can calm the storms of life like my Lord. See, God never promised that we wouldn't have storms. He said, you will have storms, but I'll help you through it. He'll give rest to the weary. Oh, we're going to get weary, but he'll give you rest. Give new life to the hopeless. There's no doubt about it. Peace, my Lord. A life that pleases God bears fruit both inward and outward. It enjoys growing in the knowledge of finding what God wants removed and added from that life. It uses that knowledge to be strengthened by God's promises, by God's control, and by God's faithfulness. And it realizes that almost everything that we have is extra <coughs> and worthy of thanks to the Father. Understand what I said there. Almost everything we have is extra. Almost everything we have is extra. And are we thankful for it? Let's work on that vertical relationship with God. Get it in the proper perspective. Make sure He's Lord. Make sure we're listening to what He wants. And that'll help us as we work on our horizontal relationships with each other. This evening, if there's something in your life that you know you haven't been doing right, something that you haven't been taking care of, you need to take care of that. You need to deal with it. If it's something that you need to bring before the congregation, we'd gladly help you with that. If you are not a child of God, if you have not been joined with Christ in baptism, then these blessings that come from God, this relation with God, that vertical relationship hasn't even started. It hasn't even started. You need to take care of that. However, we can help you in your desire to follow God and do what He wants you to do. Let us know by coming forward as we sing the selected song.